In Baltimore, crews there have taken some major steps towards reopening the city's port after the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. Workers have begun cutting the bridge into pieces, and they've already moved tons of debris in what is now a 24-7 operation. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg spoke about reconstruction of the massive bridge on Face the Nation yesterday. We haven't received estimates on that yet either. I can tell you the original bridge took about five years to build, but that doesn't necessarily inform us about the timeline uh, on the reconstruction. A lot goes into how that reconstruction will be designed, how the process is going to work. Right now, we don't fully know everything we need to know about the condition of the portions of the bridge that did not collapse. Nicole Skanga is in Baltimore with more. Steel beams, once vital to the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Maryland, now surgically cut into pieces, part of a complex wreckage removal operation. It is a mangled, cantilevered mess. Colonel S.D. Pinchasen, unified commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, says crews will scan an underwater superstructure of concrete and twisted metal after each cut. They're very careful that they're not going to send divers or equipment in without knowing for sure. They're, they're reducing the risk by not guessing. The bodies of two construction workers have been recovered. Four other victims are unaccounted for and presumed dead, and Maryland State Police have identified four missing vehicles. There it could be potential spots where there are vehicles and possibly maybe the human remains. The U.S. Coast Guard is now marking clear sections of the channel, possible passageways for smaller ships. Captain David O'Connell. I anticipate you know, smaller draft commercial vessels, maybe some small tugs uh, in the next few days. Meanwhile, we're learning more about the actions taken by police moments before the collision. Hold all traffic on the key bridge. Uh, there's a ship approaching that just lost their steering. They are heroes. They truly are. The head of the Maryland Transportation Authority Police Union credits three officers for their quick measures to stop traffic, saving dozens of lives. When they stop traffic, there was at least 25 to 30 vehicles stopped behind them each. Had these officers delayed even seconds longer, more people would have died. As a storm system moves through the area, four anchors attached to the stern of the dolly and a tug are holding that massive container ship down. Officials say that's a precautionary measure to ensure that the ship doesn't spin out, causing further damage. Chanel. Nicole, thank you. CBS News Baltimore reporter Alexis Davila is covering the bridge collapse and joins us now from Dundalk, Maryland. Uh, thanks for being with us, Alexis. Walk us through today's operation. How will this work? Well, we are expecting some changes, especially today because of this rainstorm we're dealing with. We had lightning and thunder early this morning, so we're still working to learn some updates on what the crews will be able to do. But we do know that the crews were able to secure the cargo ship and hunker it right down. That way it doesn't move in that surrounding area, destroying any more. And also that this storm won't be swaying it in any direction as well. But another piece of information that we're really excited about to hear is this idea of creating some new routes, hopefully so that way we can create some vessel flow into the port of Baltimore and start to regain some loss that we have in terms of the economic hit from that vessel traffic being halted. So what we're going to see today is actually two temporary uh, routes being open to channel temporary channel excuse me open up today there's going to be one on the northeast side and then one on the south side but there are some restrictions here not any vessel could come right through we know with the north side it can accommodate boats that are requiring 10 feet of water or less and the south side will be accommodating boats requiring 10 to 14 feet or less of draft now, with that being said, there's still some debris. The U.S. Navy's talked about up to 4,000 tons of debris. But there's some still in that south side area that they want to clear out so that way this can give some flow and have that temporary channel. Now, these vessels, though, are only for commercial vessels that have been deemed essential. This is not fully open to the full capacity to allow all that traffic back into the port of Baltimore. In terms of the wreckage, we know that we're going to expect some more equipment to come over here today as well. We're expecting another crane. This will be number four to come and pull up some of that wreckage. And Alexis, I can hear the rain in your shot there. We know more bad weather is on the way right now. How might this impact progress? 
So we think that this will definitely maybe halt some of the recovery, or excuse me, some of the wreckage efforts trying to collect. We are still learn, working to learn more about the barges and what can be delivered to them as they are pulling more out. So we are staying in contact with the command center to learn a little bit more about how many dive crews may be able to come in today or what's going to be uh, discussed if it's going to be pushed back a little further because we know that this rainstorm is not ending today. It will be continuing into Tuesday and into Wednesday. Alexis Davila, thank you. you know, Nancy, uh, we are almost a week uh, since that bridge collapsed in Baltimore in the port there. And almost immediately, President Biden said he would make a visit, uh, I think, as soon as possible, or as soon as yep. feasible. Now yep. we hear Friday is that date. How significant is the visit in the wake of this collapse? Uh, it's significant, particularly, Tony, because the White House has made it clear, uh, the broader administration has made it clear that they believe that the federal government has a role to play in rebuilding this bridge and, and paying for the rebuilding of this bridge, which is uh, undoubtedly going to cost billions of dollars. And so uh, the president there uh, on Friday is a powerful symbol, they hope, of uh, the need to get this bridge rebuilt, not just for the people who use it every day as commuters, but also, of course, for port traffic into and out of Baltimore. We don't know a lot yet about what he's going to do when he gets there, how exactly he will <coughs> survey the damage, where exactly he will speak. Uh, but this is the president making good on a, a promise, saying that he would visit as soon as it was safe to do so at a time when there are some in Congress who are questioning, on the right in particular, whether the U.S. should be shelling out more money to pay for the rebuilding of this bridge. We begin in Baltimore, where crews are taking significant steps to try and reopen the port after last week's deadly bridge collapse. The U.S. Coast Guard has opened an alternate channel for boats involved in clearing the wreckage. Workers are also cutting what's left of the bridge into pieces and moving tons of debris. Every time someone goes in the water, they are taking a risk. Every time we move a piece of the structure, the situation could become even more dangerous. We have to move fast, but we cannot be careless. I've been clear with this team that we have got to prioritize safety. And my directive is to complete this mission with no injuries and no casualties. We've already lost six Marylanders to this crisis. I refuse to lose any more. Nicole Skanga has the latest from Baltimore. Good evening, Nicole. Today, the Unified Command announcing that they will lift a 350-ton piece of debris, a mangle and twisted steel part of the bridge on the north end by the end of the day. All of this in an effort to clear that 700-foot-wide expanse of channel. Now, today, also an announcement that there is a smaller channel on the northeast side of the waterway open to some traffic, including commercial barges and some vessels that will be integral to the salvage operations in the coming days. The U.S. Coast Guard says it's also working on opening up two more channels, one along the south side and a third channel that can accommodate larger ships. Once more debris surrounding the container ship Dolly is removed, all of this activity happening before President Biden comes to Baltimore on Friday and the White House announcing today that the Small Business Administration has opened two business recovery centers in Baltimore for workers, small businesses who were directly impacted by the bridge collapse to visit and to apply for loans of up to $2 million. In the next few days, some concerns that the weather could slow down these uh, salvage efforts. We're expecting a storm system to hit starting tomorrow. Uh, right now, crews have anchored down the container ship Dolly, four anchors attached to the stern of the ship and a tug in anticipation of that weather to ensure that the container ship doesn't spin out and cause further damage. Nicole, I'll send it back to you. Let's bring in senior advisor and assistant to President Biden, Tom Perez. He's also the director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Thanks so much for being with us. And first Pleasure. off, just tell us more about President Biden's mm -hmm. visit to Baltimore. What can we expect this coming Friday? Well, the president uh, said immediately after this tragedy that we're going to move heaven and earth to help uh, the victims, their families, the community, and the rebuild. 
and he's going to be there Friday to see for himself the progress that has been made. The unified command is truly unified. We have federal, state, and local partners working away. This is a really challenging undertaking. It's 110,000 tons uh, when you add up the vessel and the, the bridge debris, 110,000 tons. So there's a lot of work to be done. We still need to recover uh, four bodies, and that work will continue. Uh, that is something that Governor Moore correctly said. We will put safety first. We want to give closure to the families. In the meantime, as you correctly point out, the Small Business Administration has already acted. The Department of Labor at a federal level is working closely with the State Department of Labor to make sure we're moving forward uh, to help displace workers. There's a lot of work streams at once, and we are doing them all, and we're doing them all as effectively uh, and safely as possible. You talked about some of the families, and I know that you met with some of the victims' families last week. Will the president also meet with them Friday? Yes, we're, we're planning the day out right now. Um, I have met with the families, and it's, uh, it, it was just profoundly sad. And as you know, the president himself is no stranger to tragedy in his own life. And that's why, as soon as he heard about this, one of the first directives to me was, make sure we are with the families, make sure we're supporting those families. Uh, I mean, these are, you know, they, they do the work that all too many people won't do. In the middle of the night, you're out on a road making sure that the next day uh, people can get to work safe and sound. Uh, the most important right a worker has is to come home safe and sound. And that didn't happen for these workers. So the president puts a very, very high value on making sure that we protect worker safety and that we take care of families. And that, that's a, going to be a big part of what we do in the days and weeks ahead. And as you know, many of the victims were from Mexico and Central America. And in terms of some of the support that you're talking about, is the White House doing anything specifically to assist their relatives, particularly yes. those who may yes. live outside of the United States? Um, I've personally, uh, within the last uh, half an hour, participated in a telephone call uh, exactly about that. Uh, there's a a, a a way to get loved ones into a country called humanitarian parole. When you lose a loved one like this and you have uh, perhaps a brother or a mother or some other uh, relative that lives in uh, Mexico or Guatemala or uh, Honduras or uh, El Salvador, which are the four countries involved here, um, there is a process for allowing them in for a certain period of time so that they can mourn with their family members. And so we're working with the Department of Homeland Security uh, to process those requests. and. Uh, we're going to continue to sit down and listen and learn from the families. Uh, I can't overstate how tragic it was. These were the bread earners. Uh, not only were they uh, supporting their families here, but um, in, in most cases they were sending money back home to loved ones. And that's a big part of this tragedy. The White House has already allocated about $60 million to help the state of Maryland in the wake of this bridge collapse. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg has called on Congress to provide more funding. Here's what he told Face the Nation. The pitch is your district could be next. And also, this has historically been bipartisan. And I'm not just reaching back to uh, bygone eras. Remember, the infrastructure package itself, President Biden's infrastructure plan, uh, went through on a bipartisan basis. Mm -hmm. As you may recall, back in 2007, Congress approved aid two days after a bridge collapse in Minnesota. Do yes. you think you can get that same type yes. of cooperation in this Congress? I do, for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, the, the Port of Baltimore is a, a resource not simply for the state of Maryland, but for the country. Uh, I mean, more cars get imported and exported from the Port of Baltimore than any other port in America. So this is a national a national. Uh, resource that's a big part of our uh, national supply chain for so many uh, critical goods that uh, come to the United States and leave from the United States. Secondly, uh, that boat you mentioned in Minnesota there, that, that um, uh, Secretary Buttigieg mentioned, the vote to help uh, the people of Minnesota in the aftermath of that uh, tragedy was 421 to zero. Um, this is not about Republicans and Democrats. This is about uh, maintaining a critical aspect of our economy and making sure that we can continue 
uh, to be the strongest nation in the world in terms of our economy and moving forward, making sure that we can do that. I'm confident we can do this in a bipartisan fashion, and we will continue to work toward that end. The president has been very clear about making sure that the federal government plays a very important role in this issue, and we'll continue to work with our our federal delegation, but frankly, with every member of uh, the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate, because as as the secretary correctly pointed out, uh, we don't know where this will happen next. We hope it will never happen anywhere else, but history teaches us that these sorts of incidents take place, and that's when we come together. And this incident, as you referenced earlier, has put a spotlight on some of the dangers that many immigrant workers face. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, mm -hmm. Hispanic workers are more likely than any other racial and ethnic groups to die on the job. So as a former labor secretary, do you think yeah. reforms are needed to make some of these jobs safer? Well, the uh, National Transportation Safety Board is looking into this. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration is looking into this. Uh, you may be aware that uh, roughly a year ago on one of the interstates in Maryland, there was another incident involving the tragic loss of lives. Um, you know, immigrants make up about 25 percent of construction workers. Um, these heroic people were doing work that, frankly, few other people are willing to do in the middle of the night. Um, they're trying to build a bridge to opportunity for their own families, and in so doing, they made the ultimate sacrifice. We've got to make sure that what I said to you earlier on in this conversation, that the fundamental right that all workers have of coming home from work safe and sound is a right in fact and not simply empty promises. And I'm sure that everybody at Occupational Safety and Health, which I used to run the Maryland Labor Department as well as the U.S. Labor Department, and I know the professionalism there, and we're going to learn from these um, tragic uh, incidents here and the one that occurred a year ago in Maryland and make sure that we do our level best to prevent these from occurring ever again. All right, Tom Perez, good to see you as always. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Let us not forget that we are coming out of a holiday weekend, but for the men and women of this operation, the work did not stop. The work did not stop surveying the area. The work did not stop on environmental monitoring. The work did not stop in developing better images of the wreckage so we can move forward in a safe and efficient way. And this morning, the team was back out there in the rain, in the wind, keeping up the work. So it's hard to overstate how dedicated and remarkable this team really is. From unified command to the leaders at local and state in our federal levels and our federal delegation, to our partners in the private sector, to our partners in the philanthropic sector, to each and every one of you, I say thank you. Now, today, I'll provide updates on the four directives that I've issued to this team. And as a reminder, the first, we need to recover the four remaining victims and give closure to these families. The second, we need to clear the channel and open the vessel to traffic for the port. The third, we need to take care of all of our people who have been affected by this crisis. And the fourth, we need to and we will rebuild the key bridge. And we will make sure that the new bridge honors the spirit of the city of Baltimore. This morning, I received a briefing from Unified Command. Now, I've spoken with leaders from all across every level in response to this effort all throughout the day. And so first, on our recovery efforts, we need to do more work clearing the channel in order to move forward. Now, I know there's an urgency to move fast. And nobody feels that urgency more than the people standing up here today. But we have to be clear on the risks. This is a steel bridge that is sitting on top of a container ship in the middle of the Patapsco River. We are talking about tons of steel that is mangled and cantilevered. We're talking about water that is so murky and so filled with debris that divers cannot see any more than a foot or two in front of them. 
We're talking about a situation where a portion of the bridge beneath the water has been described by, Un by Unified Command as chaotic wreckage. Every time someone goes in the water, they are taking a risk. Every time we move a piece of the structure, the situation could become even more dangerous. We have to move fast, but we cannot be careless. I've been clear with this team that we have got to prioritize safety. And my directive is to complete this mission with no injuries and no casualties. We've already lost six Marylanders to this crisis. I refuse to lose any more. One of the mantras in the military is mission first, people always. And that's the mindset that we are going to apply to this work. Now, on clearing the federal channel and reopening the vessel traffic to the port, Unified Command has moved forward with their first crane operation. They cut up and lifted a piece of the north section of the key bridge. The entire operation took 10 hours. And in that time, they were able to cut and lift a 200 ton span of the bridge. Now, when we were getting that briefing, Unified Command said something that really struck me, where uh, the Admiral says this was a relatively small lift. We're talking about 200 tons. We're talking about something that is almost the size of the Statue of Liberty. And what the Admiral said is right. It's a small piece of what we're talking about. The scale of this project, to be clear, it is enormous. And even the small lifts are huge. That's how we have to move forward. A temporary channel on the northeast side of the collapse opened earlier today. It will help us to get more vessels in the water around the site of the collapse. The temporary channel will be marked with government lights to aid navigation and will have a controlling depth of 11 feet. Now we're also moving forward on creating a southwest channel for deeper draft vessels that will allow for a deeper draw. That channel will measure about 15 feet deep and it will be open in the coming days. Unified Command has scheduled another lift for later today pending conditions, specifically pending lightning. And they will be lifting an estimated 350 ton piece from the bridge. The work is moving, the mission continues. We are never gonna lose sight of the workers who also have been impacted by this collapse because at least 8,000 workers on the docks have jobs that have been directly affected by this collapse. And earlier today, myself, the Lieutenant Governor, County Executive, the Mayor, and others met with the International Longshoremen Association, Local 333. These are individuals who work hard, never complain, and always get the job done. And many have continued to work on the docks. Many haven't been able to get back to work at all. And even the ones who have gone back to work on the docks, they know that the situation still feels very uncertain. And to all of those individuals, we want to let them know this. We've got their backs because they've always had ours. 